This afternoon we're going to talk about my favourite subject because this morning we already defined happiness and what's happiness and, and what isn't real happiness. So now we're going to take the part which is real happiness and refine it. So there's this beautiful process um, called, by some scholars, dependent uh, liberation. So you may have heard of dependent origination, which is a process of suffering, which starts with um, consciousness and sankara, um, volitional action. Oh, sorry, actually it's delusion. There you go, I'm deluded today. It starts with delusion and then goes into volitional action, which produces consciousness, is that right? And then it, it produces um, what we call name and form. So that's the body and the mind in brief. And then from name and form, we get the six sense doors. And from that, we get contact. From contact, we get feeling, yeah? From feeling, this Vedana, pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. Clinging, craving arises, and from that, grasping or attachment. And from there, we get the cycle of suffering repeating itself again and again and again. And from suffering, of course, we're always going into old age and death, sickness and death. So this dependent liberation, or some people call it transcendental dependent origination, is um, starting from suffering, which is rather good news because of most of us start from suffering. But instead of using, you know, just going from suffering into old age and death, into what you could call a wasted life, right? You haven't learned anything on the way. Instead of that, we can use suffering to give us confidence, to give rise to confidence. So I'll explain how it works, but um, it's a very beautiful process because stage flows into stage, and they say fills up each stage, but it does it in a natural way. So the Buddha says throughout this, that there's no need for one who has confidence to wish may joy arise because it's natural if one has confidence that joy arises. Similarly, if one is virtuous, it can also start from virtue. It's a similar sequence. There's no need to wish may non-regret or non-remorse arise because it's natural for one who's virtuous to have non-remorse or regret. And then from non-remorse or regret, there's no need again to wish may joy arise. It's natural for one who's free from regret, that they feel joyful, they feel gladness. And the whole sequence continues in this way. And, and the real implication of this is that there's not a person or an agent involved. This is a natural process of cause and effect. So in the meditation practice, rather than coming from a sense of me, the meditator, who has to fix things in my mind and has to do it and get it right, we're coming from wisdom. We're understanding what gives rise to what. So putting the causes into place for the results that, we, that are desirable to arise. Yeah? And we need to know what results we want. <laughs> so this whole sequence leads us into very deep states of peace. And then from those states of deep samadhi, we're able to have a chance to see into things the way they truly are, rather than the way we think they are, which is always what the Buddha calls sanya vipalasa. It means a distortion of perception. So we see things not as they really are, but as we want them to be or as we don't want them to be. Mm? So we're repelled from the truth because we just don't want to see that. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to um, read out a little simile for how this process works because it's very beautifully written. And this is um, from the Anguttara to a threes, but it's throughout the suttas in different um, contexts. So it says that, you know, these stages flow into each other, just like when it rains, the rain pours down heavily on a mountain top. The water flows down along the slope and fills the clefts, gullies and creeks. These becoming full fill up the pools. These becoming full fill up the lakes. The lakes becoming full fill up the streams. The streams becoming full fill up the rivers. And the rivers becoming full fill up the oceans. So too, for one who is virtuous, non-remorse arises. There's no need to make any volition, may non-remorse arise. It's natural for one who's virtuous that non-remorse arises, etc., etc. So the whole process goes on in this way, refining what we call a wholesome happiness. And I also want to talk about how we can use contentment in this process at various stages of our meditation to kind of troubleshoot any obstacles that come along at various stages. So first of all, suffering leading to confidence. So how is this possible? 
for me, the first stage with this was just to see that the Buddha taught a way out of suffering. He said that there is suffering and a way out, and there's something we can do about that. So I'm not a victim of circumstance. I can become an agent in my own happiness. I can modify you know, my reactions, my responses to whatever's arisen in a wholesome way. So the karma of the past, the karma of the past. You know, we have these bodies, we have these minds, they're conditioned in various ways. And, you know, we can do very little about sometimes about what's arising, you know, from past karma, from past actions. The Buddha said that not everything arises because of past actions. Some things arise due to the weather or due to what we've eaten, you know. You can probably feel in your stomach, you know, some sensations that have arisen because of the food. Some things arise due to accidents or, um, I think, inattention. So there are different causes for things to arise, but once they've arisen, what do we do? Do we just say, oh, I don't like it, nobody likes it, I had no choice but to kind of shout at that person, you know? Or can we modify our response? And so this is where wisdom comes in, and we can get confidence that we do have some effect, you know, we, we do have some ability to direct our minds in a wholesome way. So the Buddha also said that uh, he gave a lovely simile in the Anguttara Nikaya about a salt crystal. And this you can relate to Kama, because he said that, um, he said to the monks, what happens if you put a salt crystal in a glass of water? Can you drink that glass of water? What do you think? It's pretty salty, like a big, you know, Himalayan salt crystal. And he said, but what if you put that same salt crystal in a big lake? It's hardly salty at all, you don't even notice that salt. So what does that mean? You could relate that to the kind of mind that is meeting what arises. So if, you know, if some kind of irritation arises and your mind is already feeling quite tight and defended, then it has a really big impact, yeah? And the suffering is immense because you're already at the kind of, at your limit. I know that this can happen for me when I'm very tired, you know, my mind is kind of brittle. And so one little thing more, or one more phone call, or one more person asking, can I talk to you? It's like, oh. But if that same th situation, the same person phones me up and my mind is very spacious and filled with metta, I have a sense of being resourced, then that's wonderful. You know, I, I, I relate to that in a completely different way. And so I don't generate this unwholesome karma. Yeah? And the same if unfortunate things happen. If your mind is full of metta, compassion, contentment, you're able to cope with it easily. You know, and the little things, the little irritations, just kind of, what do you say, like water off a duck's back, doesn't affect you very much at all. Yeah? So we have a, an ability to modify what the results of past experience by the way we meet it in the present. And also with the confidence, it gives us a, a willingness and a readiness to train in virtue because we already have confidence in the Buddha's teachings. And he said, you know, that it's a wise thing to do, to live a wholesome life, to be kind to ourselves and others, to live a life of non-harm. So on faith, we take that up and we notice, wow, yes, you know, when I meditate, when I try and develop wholesome states, really, I, I live a more virtuous life and that brings me happiness. Yeah, so the Buddha said that, uh, Samadhi that's based on virtue is of great fruit and benefit. Sila parivbhavito samadhi mahapalo maha nisamso. It's something that we chant at the ordinations, bhikkhu and bhikkhuni ordinations. And maybe at the novice ordinations, I'm not sure. But this is really important because if we want to develop calm states and we want them to be lasting and stable, we need a very strong foundation and that sila is the foundation, the virtue. Yeah. And why is that? One of the reasons, I think, is because we have a kind of self-respect, a feeling of uh, feeling quite good about ourselves, good about the way our, our minds, are, well, our path, our life is moving, you know, good about the direction we're moving in. And then the mind becomes quite a nice place to hang out, you know. Okay, it's not perfect, but we have a sense of inner goodness, you know, a sense of our potential at least. And it becomes much easier to stay in the moment, to stay with ourselves and to, you know, just even sit on a cushion. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. You're only here for a day and a half. You know, we come from busy lives, all kinds of different backgrounds. And it's not easy to just be with yourself without reading, without any distraction. But if you have a sense that you're basically, you deserve this opportunity, you know, and there's some goodness in there, there's something that can be cultivated. 
then that's the beginning of the practice. Yeah, and you can develop calm states. You can go inside and feel like, yeah, this is not a bad place to be. So from the sealer, we already start to develop, like I said earlier, a kind of blameless happiness. And then the Buddha said that if one is virtuous, one doesn't even need to wish may joy arise because it's natural that joy arises. So sometimes the joy doesn't naturally arise when we sit down on the cushion and we're like, hmm, we said it should, so what's happening here? First of all, we have to give it a little bit of time. Right? We can't just sit down and expect results instantly. But another really skillful means that he talked about was to actually reflect on one's goodness. So not only to perform good acts, such as making a wonderful lunch for us all, <laughs> and also donating the entire thing and making it with such love, but afterwards, reflect on that. You know, reflect on the fact that you did something really amazing there. And you're not just feeding any old people. I mean, you're feeding basically the fourfold assembly of the Buddha's disciples, the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis, and seminaries, and the laymen and laywomen. And the Buddha said that's the greatest gift you can give. A, a gift to the fourfold assembly is, is the most productive of good karma. So what is that good karma? That's the joy that you feel in your heart, you know, before giving, during giving, and after giving. So don't forget the afterwards. Reflect on it, bring it up. You know, and, and remember how remarkable that is because that food's being used for people to meditate. That's pretty much the highest thing you can do with your life. Just to start to look inside. It doesn't matter if you're getting results or not, but what you're starting to do is take responsibility for your actions. And this, I think, is what makes the difference between people who are practicing and people who are not. You know, I mean, of course, we're all just learning. And it's not that people who meditate never take responsibility, nor that we always do, right? But at least we've got a sense that if we're suffering, it's not entirely other people's fault. It's not entirely our, you know, due to our job or relationship yeah, or wealth. Apparently, there's been some studies that show that if you have, you can only increase your happiness through wealth up to about 70,000 a year. And after that, there's no change. So there's a kind of, um, as long as you've got enough, and maybe that's enough to have a nice holiday or whatever, then it doesn't make any difference how much more wealth you accumulate. So just plugging, you know, going along the same path, trying to get more and more happiness through the same way that you've always tried doesn't work after a point. And we have to start looking inside and taking responsibility, you know, seeing what can I do to actually empower myself to have some, not control, but influence over my own well-being and that of others. So this joy is very wonderful. And um, not only can we reflect on our own virtue, we can also generate um, a sense of mudita or appreciative joy for other people. So for other people's goodness, um, for other people's qualities, maybe for our companions. And there's some very beautiful uh, places in the suttas which talk about this. One of them is um, in a community with three very wonderful monks who live together harmoniously. It says, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes, and the Buddha asks them, you know, are you, getting some, are you getting somewhere then in your meditation? And they say, yes, yes, we are. And he asks them how they live together. And they say, well, we um, put aside our own needs and we think, well, why should I do what I want to do? Why don't I do what these other venerable ones want to do? And so only after looking after each other do they then go back and meditate in the afternoon. So it's very beautiful and, and they reflect every day, what a great gain it is for me to be living with such companions in the holy life. What a great gain it is. So I can reflect that way here, you know, I'm an empty cloud monastery. How wonderful to be with Bhante Sodasso and Ayasoma. It's just marvelous. I very rarely get to hang around with other monastics and these are such wonderful beings, very sincere practitioners and doing such a lot of service. It's rare to find this kind of practice in the world. You know, it's easy enough to sit on a cushion, but to actually say, right, I'm going to use my practice to benefit others. I'm going to sacrifice my time. You know, when I could be in deep meditation, I'm going to sacrifice that to look after everybody here, to create retreats where people can get a taste of what I've experienced and maybe even, you know, generate the wish to go forth. Isn't that amazing? Because this place is going to operate as a, as a training monastery as well. So we can bring these things up, and these are really skillful ways to overcome fault-finding, depression, you know, negativity, 
you know you're getting up and you're thinking it's a bit too early or you're sort of thinking gosh you know weekend retreats are a bit rushed it's so much to do in a short space of time but that may be true but the benefit you cannot imagine you really don't know how that's going to change people's lives even just hearing the teachings expressed in a certain way sometimes it's like nothing makes sense and you hear one thing and ching it just touches you you know and it sets the course of your life in a different direction so we can bring these things up to help the joy get going, right? But of course we have to be patient with these things. And we're not meditating to um, gain things, right? We're meditating to let go of suffering. So on the one hand, we have to incline our mind to the happiness that's there right now. But on the other hand, also just let go of the places that we're still clinging and still focusing in on the bits that are wrong. When you're suffering in meditation, it's usually the first hindrance of ill will or sorry the first hindrance of wanting yeah wanting is the cause of suffering so if you're sitting down on your cushion and you're suffering it's helpful to say ask yourself like what do i want what do i want right now yeah? can i be content with what's right here if you can't be content ask why you know what are you resisting or maybe how can you approach it differently? Maybe you can approach it with more gentleness. Like I said yesterday, you could give it more space, more mental space. You know, so instead of getting really focused on a, a tight area in the body, you can just spread the attention through to parts of the body which are not in pain. Sometimes when I used to sit for like six hours at a stretch, it sounds crazy, but we built up to it naturally. But at times you'd go through extreme sort of waves of pain. And actually it was quite interesting. By then, of course, mindfulness was fairly strong. But sometimes it was so intense that you just have to stay with your extremities, you know, stay with your hands and your feet, the palms of your hand, the soles of your feet. Because these parts are usually quite pleasant, you know, just a bit tingly. And, and just wait and watch how these things arise and how they start to disintegrate after time. Nothing lasts. So it gets really interesting, and I'm not recommending that at all, but it's just different ways to work with body sensations. And the same thing with our emotional world. I mean, we can also meet it with compassion, for example, if you're really suffering, you know. We don't want to, like, run away from that, because remember that suffering, suffering can be the fertilizer for confidence, right, and for a kind of urge to find a, a freedom from suffering. So it's more a question of how do I hold that kindly, not just mindfulness which knows it but kindness which says how can I soothe and calm it down because the whole path is leading towards pacifying <coughs> soothing calming yeah so we meet things we accept them but then we calm them down and let them go so the bare awareness idea of just watching everything arise watching everything arise being with it it's okay to a point but that being with it should slowly start to move in the direction of calming and stilling and settling Okay, so we use our attention in a way that helps and facilitates that. So if, you're, if that's not happening, have a look at why. Sometimes it's the wanting. Sometimes it can be the restlessness. Yeah? The Buddha says in the Majjhima 39, I think it's the Maha Asapurita Sutta, I think. Um, he says that restlessness makes us like a slave. We're basically being dragged from here to there against our wishes. So it's tyrannical, it's saying, come on, do this, do that. And the reason we're restless is because we're not finding enough joy in the moment with what is. We're not noticing the beauty and appreciating the contentment. Contentment's very subtle, yeah? Stillness, silence are very subtle. So we have to learn to tune into those subtler happinesses. I had a story in... Um, Belgium, I think it was, years and years ago, where um, I had an asthma attack because I used to get fairly bad asthma, um, especially uh, triggered by dust. And I was in a Vipassana centre at the time and meditating quite intensively. And uh, I had my inhaler with me, so I wasn't scared about it because I knew I could take it, but I wanted to see what would happen if I just stayed with it. And it was in the night, so I was lying in my bed and, and just trying to be equanimous, being with my bodily sensations and being aware of the situation. And for about two or three hours, it wasn't subsiding, but I was okay, my mind was balanced and it wasn't getting worse either. But then at one point I just realized that my mindfulness was, 
was kind of resisting going into the area of the chest because that was the area that felt contracted and that I almost I couldn't get enough oxygen into. So it was really interesting because when I noticed that at some point when my mindfulness was strong enough, I got the confidence to just touch into it. And I touched into that um, tightness and constriction in my chest. And it was amazing. It was though everything just lifted in an instant. And it felt as though oxygen were coming from my feet up to my body, up to my head. And my, the whole experience lifted almost in an instant. And it was just because I got the attitude right. There was a certain letting go, which meant surrendering to that sensation instead of resisting it. So I was able to actually go into it. And, and again, you know, we have to be ready. It took me about three hours, <laughs> but it was really interesting. And the next day I was quite bright and aware. <laughs> I wasn't sleepy as I thought I might be. And it's the same with the mental world, you know, something can be arising. And if you just sort of suddenly change the way you see it, it can, it can just mm -hmm. vanish in an instant or more slowly, which is more common. So that's the restlessness and the, um, and the uh, wanting. And then the fault-finding mind, which is the hindrance of aversion, you know, when we just don't like what's happening. In these kind of cases, it's really helpful to open your heart to whatever it is with a sense of unconditional acceptance, kindness, loving kindness, yeah? which embraces everything. And if that's not possible, you can actually practice some metta. If you see that this is your tendency, you know, to be very fault-finding or very aversive, um, then metta practice is really helpful. I mean, you may do it at the beginning of the meditation, even when there is some joy already there, just to boost it. But I, I do find it quite helpful to make it a regular practice, whether in daily life or at the beginning of my sittings. Yeah, just to get my mind in a very positive direction. And you can always tell if you are slightly aversive because when you start practicing metta, you feel happy. So that shows there was some aversion there to overcome. Yeah. So metta is a wonderful, wonderful practice that also feeds into right attitude. So then the Buddha said, <coughs> excuse me, that if there's this gladness in the mind, a sense of uplift, a sense of happiness, not very deep at this stage. He said that it's natural for PT to arise. And PT is a slightly deeper kind of happiness, often translated as rapture. Um, it's difficult to get translations for these words, but I guess it's kind of like um, the mindfulness is starting to really build and you're getting really interested in what you're watching. So if you're watching the breath, for example, it's the sort of stage in meditation where some happiness and some joy starts to arise with the breath, enough to keep you with the breath. So you're able to really stay with it because it interests you. So you notice that when this joy starts to increase, mindfulness starts to increase. And because mindfulness increases, your energy increases. And energy is happiness. So energy increases the joy, the joy increases the mindfulness, and the whole thing starts to snowball. My meditation teacher, Ajahn Brahm, calls it the pivot point of meditation when you're getting the happiness coming up with the breath because the mind just starts to settle into it and it, it, you don't need a lot of force to hold it anymore. Yeah. Well, the breath is something very delicate, so we have to hold it gently. It's like there, was a, there is a simile in the suttas about a bird and how to hold a bird just with the right touch so that you don't crush it or let it fly away. But I had my own experience last year in Australia and there was actually a little bird who'd um, somehow come out of his nest a little bit prematurely very beautiful, they're called honey eaters. They're sort of black and white with little black and white stripes on their um, neck and in their wings and, and streaks of yellow as well. And, um, and it had come out of the nest and was unable to get back because it was probably a bit too tired. And uh, so some people had noticed it, some of the retreatants and the monk had noticed and put it in a little um, sort of pot with a few tissues on it because we thought it might be cold. And anyway, I went up to this pot and suddenly I was like, oh my goodness, it's trying to escape. So it started to move again. And, uh, and it actually jumped onto my hand, which I was quite surprised about because I thought it might be more timid than that. And then it actually jumped onto my shoulder and I thought, gosh, it's not scared of me. And so I touched it and actually held it in my hand. And then I realized that there was a certain way I could hold it that would keep it with me. I sort of would have my 
um, forefinger and thumb in a, in a circle, just the right size so that its neck was sort of held but not too tightly. And every so often it wanted to go away, so I let it and it would come back again and I'd hold it in this particular way. And the nice story was that um, I didn't know what to do, but some adult birds were flying nearby, which were obviously the same species. And looking at this bird, and I was thinking, oh, maybe they, you know, want to take him back. Maybe, maybe it's their baby. But I was worried that they would reject it because it had been held by a human. But one of the monks came by and said, don't worry about it. I know where it lives. And I was like, oh, great. So he said it lives in this bush. So we put it in the bush. And it just, you know, very gently went off my finger, held onto the twigs. And immediately the mother came and fed it. And it was just so lovely to see that, that the parents kind of trusted us and were not um, put off by the fact that the bird had been with uh, human strangers. So as I was saying the other night, you know, the animals and the birds, the kangaroos in those monasteries and in most monasteries are very tame. I think the chicken here are the same. They don't mind you touching them and <laughs> stroking them. <laughs> yeah, very, very trusting. So it's the same with the mind when we have the breath, you know, if we hold it really tightly and try and contract it into a certain area, it becomes quite unpleasant to hold. But if we just allow the mind to fill the, sorry, the breath to fill the mind, you know, as though there's masses of space for the breath, just let it really permeate the mind, then the mind becomes very happy and slowly starts to settle. Mm. So we're looking for this kind of spacious and relaxed but very bright sort of awareness that can stay with things. There's another um, lovely quote, and um, earlier on Bhante was saying he prefers quotes from the Buddha, but this is from my teacher, and I think he's, you know, he's quite an expert on meditation. And he has a lovely um, piece of advice for what to do when the PT doesn't arise, the rapture doesn't arise. <coughs> So he said, when it doesn't arise, it must be because there's not enough contentment. That is, one is still trying too hard. Yeah. So this is interesting because we often think that if we try a bit harder, it'll work. But he's saying that it actually doesn't arise because we're trying too hard. In other words, we're in the way of the natural process. Right? We're not letting the causes and effects take off. We think we know best. And I've had this experience before at this stage, you know, where there's a very subtle sense of this knower, the sense of self as the knower, the one who has to have a look at what's going on, or the doer, actually, both. And I call it kind of the sticky fingers. It's like, what's happening now? Where's it going next? It doesn't even have to be verbal. You know, it's just this movement of the mind that wants to kind of check it out, analyze it. And I'm very analytical, so it comes in at this stage sometimes. So he said, when this happens, one should reflect on the first two of the hindrances. Sensory desire draws the attention of the to the object of desire and thus away from the breath. Yeah, so it's moving outward onto something else. And sometimes we don't even realize it's happened for quite some time because it's so intoxicating to think about pleasures of the senses. Ill will, on the other hand, finds fault with the experience of the breath and the dissatisfaction with the breath repels the attention from it. And then this is very interesting. He says, contentment is the middle way between desire and ill will. I mean, not the literal middle way that the Buddha teaches. But if you think about it, contentment's quite pleasant. So it's a different kind of um, satisfaction. It keeps one's mindfulness with the breath long enough for the piti sukha to arise. So that's for the rapture and happiness to arise. So it's just a matter of waiting and being patient. It's not a matter of trying to, in a way, like pull up the little plants before they're ready to grow. Apparently there was a story in Perth about um, somebody who planted some seeds and uh, they were so eager, a little boy was so eager for them to sprout that he kept going back to them every day and looking, have they sprouted yet? Have they sprouted yet? And finally, after weeks, and his dad kept saying, you know, give it time, it takes the rain, it takes the sunshine, you know, it takes its own time, it's, it's nature, right? Nature has its own rhythms. And uh, finally, they started to show, and, you know, these little shoots came up. And he waited again, and he waited again. It's like, Daddy, they're not growing very fast. And one day, he just couldn't stand it any longer, and he went there, 
And he started stretching them. <laughs> and of course he killed everyone. Yeah. So this is what we do sometimes with our meditation. We stretch it. You know, there should never be that sense of like having to stretch for something, aim for something, strive. You know, it should really be the opposite movement in and down and into. Yeah, really landing on something and going inward. Mm -hmm. So what else can happen at that point? Yeah, another thing that can happen at this stage, which is quite common actually, is that the bliss is very enticing and very lovely, but you're not quite used to it. And sometimes people think, oh, hang on a minute, this is wrong, I shouldn't be enjoying this. And at this time, again, it's really helpful to remember what the Buddha said about the right kinds of pleasure and the safe kinds of pleasure, in a sense. He said that these kind of pleasures of the mind are not to be feared, but are to be cultivated, to be practiced, repeatedly developed, made much of. Yeah? Bhavetabham, it means to be developed, they should be developed. So at this stage, you know, we can just remind ourselves that these pleasures are part and parcel of the process. And just in the, as in the same way we've been learning to be with the unpleasant, we have to sometimes learn to be with the pleasant. It sounds kind of strange, but um, I was having a retreat one time and there was a lot of bliss coming up. And I was thinking, gosh, I'm not sure that, you know, I can handle this. And I went to a Dhamma talk with my teacher in, in Perth and I was really taken aback because in that talk he was talking about patience and he said you have to be patient with the difficulties, be patient with the pain and he said endure it and then he said even endure the bliss and when he said endure the bliss it was just like light bulb you know <laughs> so interesting because even that can be quite exciting it can be a bit stimulating even a bit scary because something's starting to happen that we're not in control of. And that undermines the sense of the self as the agent, the one in control, the doer. Yeah. Another problem that can happen here is that we don't feel we deserve it. This happens to me sometimes. I get into that and I think, okay, that's enough. Yeah, just because, yeah, I shouldn't enjoy too much. A little bit's okay. <laughs> so we have to learn, you know, that we do deserve it because it's not, again, about a self. It's just a natural process doing its thing. So sometimes a bit of self-forgiveness is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness practices. Just accepting that we've made mistakes in the past and offering ourselves forgiveness for that. You know, we're human. And, and helping ourselves to put those things down. So the Buddha says, from PT, it's natural. One doesn't need to make any volition for tranquility to arise because it's natural when one is full of rapture that the body and mind start to become tranquil. So at a certain stage these things do start to settle but it's almost like you need to drink your fill of it first because often we're sort of so much in suffering we're not used to these happinesses of meditation. So we need to get really used to that and, and soak it in and then in time it starts to settle and become much more still and much more peaceful. Yeah. And then from that stillness it leads into happiness, and this is called sukha. And one of my teachers, a lay woman called Shaila Catherine, she actually equates sukha to contentment, which is interesting because it's a very deep happiness that wants for nothing. And it's not the stimulating, agitating kind of happiness. Remember, it's born of tranquility. Yeah, so the previous factor, the pasadi, was a still, very peaceful happiness. And this sukha is a very sweet, sort of soft, kind of happiness. And from this kind of happiness, the Buddha says that one doesn't need to make any wish, may stillness arise, because it's the proximate cause, basically, for samadhi. Samadhi pachya, oh no, that's the wrong one. Sukhinam chito samadhi yati. Yeah, sukhino chitam samadhi yati. It means from a happy mind, one becomes still. So you can't really expect to get into these deep states of meditation through pain, through a painful approach, you know, or a painful path. We have to have some amount of joy and happiness before the mind will really unify with its object. It has to feel ready to surrender fully to the breath. And at this stage of happiness, things start to happen, like the breath can start to disappear. Maybe people see lights in the mind or they experience the breath as sort of a very soft, a sense of softness, like cotton wool. Usually it's lights and visual nimitters, we call them nimitters. Sometimes it's feeling nimitters. 
whatever it is, it's starting to become increasingly mental. So you're going away from the five senses and into the mind, more deeply into the mind. So the breath starts to disappear. And at that stage, fear and excitement can come up because again, you're going into unknown territory. So if you notice fear and excitement coming up at that stage, again, it's usually just a good idea to gently tell yourself calm, calm, or just let go, yeah? Or contentment, just contentment, just stay with it, stay where you are. And another skillful means is to um, notice what your tendencies are at that point, you know, or in meditation in general. And at the beginning of the meditation, you program your mindfulness. So you say to yourself, when happiness starts to arise, I will not get excited. When happiness starts to arise in the meditation, I will not be excited. And you say this three times, or whatever it is, yeah? Or when, I don't know, when pain arises, I'll be content with that. Whatever it is that is your difficulty, you can program your mindfulness at the beginning. Because our minds are malleable, they're conditioned, right? So we have this ability to put in a program. And then you just forget it and you meditate as usual. And this can help when you get into those stages to remind you to let go a little bit more. So samadhi is always a result of letting go, deep letting go, what we can call surrender. So you give your trust to the meditation, to the object, to the happiness, yeah? and to the nimitta. And samadhi is a really important uh, and wonderful stage on the path because, as I said, the Buddha says that it's from here that we can develop insight, deep insight. Of course, insight is there, hand in hand with the process, all along the way. But at this stage, the insight can be much deeper because you've actually abandoned the five hindrances completely. And again, there's a very beautiful passage in the suttas which describes how it feels to abandon these hindrances completely. <coughs> so the Buddha says, and I'm going to change the language because it's um, always male. <laughs> Nothing against male at all. Um, I think I'll make it gender neutral. So he says, community, suppose one were to take a loan and undertake business and the business was su to succeed so that one could repay all the money of the old loan and there would remain enough extra to maintain a spouse or a partner. Then on considering this, one would be glad and full of joy. So this is a synonym for sensual pleasure, a metaphor for sensual pleasure. So he's equating sensual pleasures as taking out a loan, having a debt, in other words. Then the next one is about overcoming anger. Suppose one were afflicted, suffering and gravely ill. Their food would not agree with them and their body had no strength. But later they would recover from the affliction and the food would agree with them and the body would regain strength. Then on considering this, one would be glad and full of joy. Yeah. Or suppose one were imprisoned. Okay, what's this one? Imprisonment. Which one's that? Sloth and uh, yeah, this one's sloth and torpor. So the mind is like in a prison, you know, it can't, it doesn't know how to get out. It's just like in a slumber. So suppose one were imprisoned in a prison house and later would be released from that prison, safe and secure, with no loss to their property. Then on considering this, one would be glad and full of joy. And then the next one is the restlessness and remorse. So suppose one were a slave, not self-dependent, but dependent on others, unable to go where they wanted, but later they would be released from slavery, self-dependent, independent of others, a freed person, able to go where they wanted. Then on considering this, they would be glad and full of joy. And the last one is about overcoming doubt. Suppose a person with wealth and property were to enter a road across a desert, but later on would cross over the desert, safe and secure with no loss to their property. And on considering this, they would be glad and full of joy. So too, community, when these five hindrances are unabandoned, a bhikkhu sees them respectively as a debt, a disease, a prison house, a slavery, and a road across a desert. But when these five hindrances have been abandoned, they see that as freedom from debt, health, release from prison, freedom from slavery, 
and a land of safety. Yeah, isn't that great? So you're free for the first time from these tyrannical um, hindrances, defilements, obscurations of the mind, which keep us from this happiness and keep us from seeing the beautiful mind. In another simile, the Buddha likened the mind after samadhi to liquid gold. He said, it's like you've melted down the gold and it's become free from impurities. Those impurities being the five hindrances. Yeah, so like lead, steel, copper, anything that's not gold. So you melt down that gold and once it's free from impurities, it becomes malleable. It becomes soft, workable, pliant. And he says it's fit for work. Basically, you can make anything you want out of it. So in the same way, the mind after samadhi is very malleable and it can be used for insight in the way you want. So if you want to explore impermanence, you can do. If you want to implore, explore the teachings of non-self and go through these five khandhas, the body, the feelings, the perceptions, what else? The volitional reactions, in other words, the way we respond or react to things, you know, our conditioned habits. And the consciousness itself, we can explore those and we can see that they're impermanent, non-self and suffering. So I'm just giving you a big picture. I mean, all these things are, you know, further down the path for most of us, but it's good to know where the path is headed. Because of course, when we are able to see deeply into these things, you know, this is where things like stream entry happen where you first understand things like the fact that there is no self here, we are this conditioned process. What a relief to know that this is just conditioned. Yeah, It's not permanent, we don't have to be with this forever. And it's the identification that causes most of the suffering. Imagine if you could just live in this body and treat it in this mind and relate to it just like nature. You know, It's just aspects of nature doing their thing. There's no ownership of that. Imagine the freedom that would bring. You'd be able to just let it go in the way it needed to, but of course you'd be programmed so deeply by virtue and you know so many of the defilements of the mind would be overcome that you'd have this sense of joy and happiness wherever you went. Yeah. So this is what we're aiming for and this is the deepest kind of contentment as a state of mind. So I hope this gives us some kind of idea and some little meditation hints about how we can use contentment along the way at each stage of the practice and the kind of direction the practice moves in. So don't be afraid of happiness and remember that the happiness you cultivate in everyday life through your good actions of body, speech and mind, they all kind of help and support your practice of meditation. So you know, the more service you can do, the more you can develop and deepen your practice. So this is a wonderful opportunity and I can't help but re relate it back to where we are right now because this facility you have here is going to enable you to practice the whole of the path, not in your isolated lives, away from each other with maybe people who don't practice, but with each other, with other practitioners who can support you and who can you know, talk to you and remind you of the direction this is supposed to be going in. You can talk about your problems in meditation, ask questions of each other, ask questions of the monastics. They're very knowledgeable. <laughs> they know a lot about the suttas. And of course it's lived, it's being lived. As a monastic, you give your whole life to this. So this is like, in a way, your thesis. It's like studying the mind, understanding it. So very, very fortunate to be here. And, um, and I wish you well in your practice. So I think it's time for a little break. I thought we'd have a break before we do a guided meditation, um, just to keep the spirit of calm relaxation. So please remember to stay within yourself. Try and carry your meditation out of here into different postures, into tea drinking postures or toilet postures or whatever else it is. And uh, don't let those hindrances in through any of the sensors. Yeah? Keep that mindfulness protecting you. And I'll see you back here at quarter past. Um, I'll probably ring the bell in 10 minutes. <laughs>